Good evening, everybody, and uh, you're very welcome to this evening's event, which marks the launch of Mervyn Busteed's monograph on the Orange Order in Liverpool. As most of you will know, I'm Professor Frank Shovlin of the Institute of Irish Studies, and uh, Mervyn has been a great friend of the Institute of Irish Studies over many years, um, including in recent years, his support of the Busteed postdoctoral fellowships, several of which have been held by scholars who have gone on to greater things and, sc and are scattered across the Irish studies universe from New York to Newfoundland and beyond. Mervyn was born and educated in Belfast, spent most of his career as a human geographer at Manchester University, chaired the British Association for Irish Studies and is an honorary research fellow at the Institute here. He's going to be in conversation tonight about the book with John Belcham. John is an Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Liverpool, whose work covers popular radicalism in 19th century Britain, the history of the Isle of Man and Irish emigration. He has a special interest in the history of Liverpool. He was made a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 1987 and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He served as head of the School of History, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool. His seminal book, Irish, Catholic and Scouse from 2007, made a vital contribution to the historiography of the Irish in Britain. Please welcome Mervyn and John. Well, thank you very much, Frank, for, for that introduction. <coughs> Just let my head sort of um, lose its swelling for the moment. Um, right, now, um, we're here to talk about the launch of a very, very important new book. For a long, long time, I've been waiting for the definitive study of the Orange Order in Liverpool, looking beyond the sort of violent sectarian clashes which preoccupied an earlier generation of historians, to look at the enduring day-to-day -day functionalism of what belonging to the order actually meant to so many people. Um, I would be extremely ill-equipped to have tried to tackle a topic like that, but I think uh, Mervyn is ideally suited, in part because of his provenance, at which Frank has already hinted. I mean, this is somebody from Protestant working class West Belfast, if I've, if I've got it right. Um, so that, in a way, gave you a, a way in to a culture uh, which is, is very rich in its way, but um, to some people might seem a little alien. But I mean, how did, what really got you interested in the topic, Mervyn? Was it just, just where you came from? or? Was it something that happened later on to you, which really stirred your intellectual curiosity? To a considerable extent, it is where I came from, because West Belfast um, was for many years the real cockpit uh, of Northern Irish politics from the late 19th century until well into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, particularly parliamentary politics, where mm -hmm. the majority of the winner was sometimes very slender. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes, let's put it this way, the discourse was more than verbal, um, which is to say they fought each other in the streets on occasions. Uh, I was brought up in an area that was indeed exclusively working class, Protestant, strongly loyalist. Uh, the street where I spent most of my time, deeply segregated, but oh, yes, there were two Roman Catholic ladies lived in it, but everybody knew of them. Um, and that means, in fact, that in the background, there's always the Orange Order. Uh, in terms of ambient noise, uh, especially on the 12th of July, but also in the church parades. But it was always something I noticed that at a certain time of the month, some local men would appear quite well dressed mm -hmm. and would go off somewhere. Um, and it turned out that that was Lodge Night. And Lodge Night was quite clearly deeply embedded in their social life mm -hmm. and in their activities. That not that they talked much about the affairs of the Lodge um, outside the Orange Hall, because strictly speaking, members of the Orange Order shouldn't. But you would hear the occasional tight-lipped comment. Mm -hmm. um, and then you realized, yes, they are members of the Orange Order. 
and my own family, in fact, um, my father was briefly a member, um, fairly briefly, I think. I still have his regalia, in fact. But, um, he didn't take it particularly seriously because, as I think I said to you in a previous conversation, my father actually only took three things seriously. His family, his job, and his support for Linfield, the local Protestant football club. Um, but it's almost as if he had to be a member, or you had to be a member of the Orange Order to prove you were sound <coughs> in political and religious terms. Mm -hmm. Having said religious terms, I must confess, uh, the family was not really church going in any significant uh, sense. Mm -hmm. And that is where I was born and brought up and all the family at least the northern branch of it, mm -hmm. is exclusively Protestant and Unionist. Right. Now, I mean, we can understand that in the, in the context you've explained about um, Protestant West Belfast and so on, but how does something like that get transported to, to, to Liverpool? I mean, what's, why is the Orange Order so significant here? I mean, because it's not part of, inverted commas, the Irish question. That was something that I wondered about myself. I, when I sort of came over here about 19, I'm trying to remember when I emigrated, I think it was 1968. But I was already aware, watching the 12th of July processions in Belfast, that there was an element there parading from um, the Irish Republic from south of the border. There was an element from Toronto amongst the Orange Men walking along. Uh, on the 12th of July, but there was also an element from Liverpool. So when I came over, mm -hmm. I was aware of their presence over here. Um, I never really questioned it until I came across Frank Neal's book mm -hmm. on sectarian conflict. Um, and I think some people here knew Frank Neal, and mm -hmm. one or two of them, I think, uh, wor worked with him. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I still didn't understand why they were here. Um, then I came across Waller's book, of course, mm -hmm. on uh, um, yeah. pol politics yeah. in Liverpool, uh, and the order is mentioned. But I still didn't understand why they were mm -hmm. here. You know, there was running through both of those books an assumption that it was incoming Irish Protestant immigrants yeah. who essentially founded the order here and down through the years as sub subsequent generations came into it, uh, they were basically the backbone uh, of the order. Um, and I was never totally convinced of that. Mm -hmm. So I always wondered why. How, why would it take root here um, in Liverpool? But I never really had a chance to investigate that until I retired. In the meantime, I was very much preoccupied with um, the British Association of Irish Studies, and I started looking at the Irish over here in Britain, and I focused on Manchester, mm -hmm. which of course uh, is a very strongly Catholic Irish community uh, mm -hmm. in there. Um, there. There was a noise off from um, one or two lodges uh, in the Manchester area, especially up with a district known as Harper Hay up Rochdale Road, which is also a very strong Catholic Irish area. Mm -hmm. But I never got into things until I came across a deposit of Orange Order records in the Central Library. Mm -hmm. And that was by pure chance. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was going to ask you about the, the, the archives and so on that you, were, that you used, but um, just following on a little bit from what we've just been talking about, I mean, the, it's not just that the Orange Order is transplanted uh, across the Irish Sea here in Liverpool, but actually becomes huge and really significant and very, very large, far beyond anything else you, you really, well, certainly you would see in, in, in England. Uh, and that's, that, that is really quite, quite remarkable. Um, well, we'll come back to that perhaps a little bit later because we have mentioned the, the archives and that's one of the things that really attracted me to your you know, because, you know, as a historian, I, I, I live for dusty archives and, and you've clearly found them, which in a way that most of us thought they, they weren't there. So, um, I mean, you talk at some stage, you, you, you quote somebody about sort of the serendipity of what you come across, by what, you know, what gets preserved and what you can, can retrieve and so on. Can you just tell us a little bit about the, the, some of the sources you've been able to uncover and come across? Yeah, the main source, in fact, is a deposit of archives that has, was put into Central Library by various lodges within mm -hmm. the Liverpool province. Just to explain, 
I mean, the orange order is ordered in such a way that the basic, the basis of it is what's known as the private lodges, the okay. local lodges. They are organised into districts and they in turn are grouped uh, into provinces and Liverpool is a province. Um, now, traditionally, the Orange Order has never, either in Britain or in Ireland, been enthusiastic about letting people into its archives. Mm -hmm. It's partly because I think at times they feel they've uh, had a hard deal from people who have looked in from outside to what they could get their hands on. And also sometimes some of the public reporting has been by reporters and newspapers which have taken a hostile stance. Um, and really, it was, I suppose, in some ways, the initiative was taken by the Irish Orange Order, because uh, that is the dominant element in, in world, world Orangism. And Orangism is a world movement, incidentally. Indeed. Um, and they actually, as the troubles built up in Northern Ireland in the late 1960s and early 70s, felt that they we're not getting a good uh, press. And an element grew up within them that said, come on, let's reach out rather more, you know? Mm -hmm. um, let's form an education committee. Let's actually start organizing seminars and conferences um, so that people can meet us as an orange order. Um, and let's uh, send public representatives to meetings and seminars as well. Now, in the end, of course, they've got a Museum of Orange Heritage in Belfast. And I think uh, I might be wrong, but I always had the impression that perhaps to some extent, the way in which the order in Northern Ireland for a time, because there's been a change in their internal yeah. politics, uh, opened out rather more than possibly this may have inspired uh, people in Liverpool um, to see if, you know, put some of their records actually into um, the, the central library. Um, and there is a deposit there. Uh, I'm trying to remember offhand, there's nothing recording meetings of the province. Three districts have material there, uh, and about, I think it's 15 or 16 lodges put material in. Mm -hmm. and the thing is, though, I'll be honest, um, what I've worked at is merely, it is not a random sample no. of the history of the order mm -hmm. down through the years. It's really what individuals, secretaries uh, and, uh, and others took as their initiative to put the material in. Um, and what actually annoys me, and I think it probably would annoy you as an historian as well, mm -hmm. is when you think of the amount of material from Orange Lodges, districts and provinces that actually has gone in the bin or in, yeah. uh, into a skip. You know, imagine the situation where perhaps you're a secretary of a lodge, you accumulate um, you know, the, your, your records down through the years, you die, uh, the family is not sympathetic to the order, doesn't understand what it is, and toss the stuff out. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, that's heartbreaking <laughs> to think of it. But, uh, you know, that's priceless, that material. If it goes into the central library, um, it's very well looked after, as I know from uh, working closely with the people there. And there is an exhibition, incidentally, of orange order material in the central library. Um, it opened about uh, a fortnight ago, I think it was, and it will be there until about the end of January, beginning of February. And that gives you, it's in five cases in the Picton reading room up on the first floor. And in some ways, actually, it's a very illuminating demonstration of the depth and extent of the Orange Order and its work. Right. That's the sort of material I, uh, I was working on. But I'm very anxious to say that what I've done OK, it gives some insight into the workings of the Liverpool Orange Order, but it's not a random sample. It's the best I could do with what was available. Well, I think you've done very well with it, if I may say so. And it's allowed it to get some understanding of a rather enduring lifestyle based around ultra-Protestantism, uh, loyalist royalism, ritualized meetings, mutual aid, intensive um, socializing, periodic public procession. Um, and even, uh, as you say in the book, there's, there is a role for, for women and for, and for, and for youths. Yes. Um, I've never seen any serious academic work on the juvenile lodges before, right. uh -huh. ever. 
Uh, fortunately, there's material, I think, on three juvenile lodges uh, for a period in the 50s to the 60s. Um, and there's also material there from some of the women's lodges. Right. Um, and thereby raises a question, of course. <laughs> Do you want to explore that at all? I mean, uh, I mean they, they, they have a, a significant, but should we say subordinate role? Would yes. that be? Uh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you find actually with the Orange Order, it is very much male dominated. Mm -hmm. Um, it has its roots in Ireland in yes. September 1795 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. in the tradition of what was called public banding in Ireland, yeah. um, which means simply people who find themselves under stress and that their community really facing an existential crisis, as various communities did in Ireland in the early 1790s, then came together in organisations and associations to express their loyalties, to express their fears, to yeah. uh, defend their status. And the Orange Order was one of those, um, just one of many. Mm -hmm. right. um, it transfers it transfers over here in the first place because, of course, um, you find that there's a large number of British regiments, uh, English regiments and Scottish regiments that served in Ireland in the 1790s, particularly around about the time of the 1798 Rising. Um, and they, they found the Orange Lodges were thriving and the soldiers actually enjoyed, well, the, the ultra-Protestantism, um, the anti-Catholicism, which is long running strand in British mm -hmm. English nationalism, so, yeah. um, the, the loyalism, um, and also, it must be said, the act of social life, very well lubricated um, mm -hmm. at those lodge meetings mm -hmm. in the 1790s and the early 1800s. Yeah. So when they came over here, uh, now, some of them had actually organized themselves into lodges when they were in Ireland, um, and they refounded their lodges over here. But then, sort of, they put down some roots in the population over here because they're tapping into traditional British and English anti Catholicism. Mm -hmm. But also, this is a time of war. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they want to, people wanted to express their loyalism and their patriotism. And one way to do that was to find orange lodges over here. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really interests me and I think a number of historians about about this is that the, one of the odd and really you know, difficult things sometimes people have to understand about the history of Liverpool is that it was the, the most quintessentially Tory town that you could think of mm -hmm. um, throughout the 19th century and up in, well into the second half of the 20th century. Now what's the role that Orangism plays in this and uh, I've got a, I have difficulty sometimes with this because it's quite clear that when we enter the age of reform with the first uh, Great Reform Act of 1832, municipal reforms coming in 1835 and so on, at long last, um, the, the Whigs or the Liberals gained power in Liverpool. They managed to push out the Tories who were accused of corruption and God knows what else. Um, and these Whigs and Liberals start about a programme of reform. Um, and for them, the, the starting point for reform is, is education. Yes. And what they're trying to do there is to find a form of education which will be genuinely non-sectarian in view of their commitment to civil and religious liberties. So this means that they sort of copy what's going on in Ireland and introduce a form of corporation school in which you use the Catholic Dewey Bible. Now this, of course, is an absolute affront uh, to what most people consider to be the heart of both Protestantism and British nationalism. Uh, you know, the, the, man, the, the person's right to the free, unrestricted Bible is absolutely fundamental. And nobody is better at giving rhetorical uh, gusto to this than the Irish Brigade, the, the 39 articles that come over with, with the Reverend Hugh McNeil, um, who leads a tremendous tirade uh, against events, well, you can put all the nasty things as he sees it together. Uh, if you're Catholic, you're liberal. And if you're a Catholic liberal, you're also a reformer. Uh, and all those things have got to be stopped. Uh, and he's got the rhetoric to do it. Um, and this proves immensely powerful in the way that the Tories realize that having had to abandon the old ways of corruption and bribery, having to abandon their dependence upon the freemen as the, the freemen are, are so slowly um, pushed out of, of the politics things they need something new and they pick up on McNeil's rhetoric and that's really the rhetoric which I think goes right into informing why the orange order is so strong because 
uh, you know, when you look at it, again, I, I speak as someone who's really rather naive on this, you know, I would have thought my starting point that uh, if you're in the Orange Order, uh, you're, a, you're an Ulster Protestant. Uh, look at the composition of the Orange Order in Liverpool. You cannot distinguish between Ulster migrants and native born working class Liverpudlians. Uh, they're all there because they see in this that the English constitution is a threat from popery, uh, from liberalism, from reform. Uh, so they come together in this really strong phalanx, which is going to keep the Tories there for a long, long time. But the worrying thing about this, which this is the way you know, I sort of thought about what brings uh, Orangeism forward, but I mean, Mervyn can tell you all sorts of other things, including all sorts of um, amazing theological arguments which are going on in the 1830s and so on. Um, but what's happening, just as the Conservatives, the Tories, are finding this winning formula of ultra-Protestant anti-Catholicism and so on, it's just at that point that the Orange Order itself gets disbanded. Um, but of course it comes back and it comes back fantastically strongly and it becomes part of that interweaving network of associations, um, sectarian and otherwise, which bring the, 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 the Tories together. Um, and I was just thinking about this because another one of these questions that one always asks about Liverpool um, is, you know, why don't we have sectarian allegiance um, for, the, for the football teams? Um, and then you suddenly look at it and you think, well, who really brings these football teams into being? And it's someone like John Holding. And I watch John Holding. He's, a, he's an orangeman. Uh, he's a Freemason. Um, he, he owns pubs and brewers and, our host, um, and, um, and hotels. Um, he's a conservative politician. Um, he becomes Lord Mayor, um, you know, he starts off with, uh, with Everton, uh, but then he gets a bit fed up with that, and so he then goes on and forms, and forms Liverpool. So you've got the same point. He is just the type of bloke which keeps the Tories there. You know, he's got that common touch. He can mix in with people in the Orange Lodge. He can mix in with things. So the Conservatives have this terrific hold over the politics, but never once do you get a working class Tory uh, councillor, not into well into the 20th century, precisely because you have these notables who perhaps through going to lodge nights and so on, know how to mix with, with, with people. So I do find that really quite fascinating, but I'm, I'm going to shut up in a minute, Melvin. I'm just, just on my political, go on, go on, go on. my political, <laughs> I'm on my political diatribe, but, and I'm try, trying to work this, try, I'm still trying to come to terms with the, with the history of Toryism in Liverpool, you see, but, um, you know, the, 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 the thing is with the Orange Order, I mean, we've said, everything, well, I was going to say, it all seems to matter as much as, as, as something else, but they don't. I mean, they are Protestants first. They're Protestants actually before they're Tories or, or, or even British, as it were, I think. Um, and so it gets to the position where no popery, which had been a, a very useful cry and slogan to use in the early 19th century to defend church and state. And it was the way, you know, the established church, the Tory party and so on. And all that. No popery suddenly becomes very different when you get these very militant Protestants taking it over. Um, who really don't trust either the Anglican Church because that's got this little bit of ritualism and Anglo-Catholicism touched to it. So, you know, that there's, so that's very worrying, you know, the Antichrist has got in there. And, and look at the same thing with the, with the, with, with, with the Tory party, you know, that the, the Tory party are, are getting a little bit worried about some of the um, behaviour of these really militant Protestants who, who take over. Protestants who are shopkeepers or lower and so on. I don't really like these conservative notables that we've been talking about, you know, the ones like Holding. I mean, it gets a time when the Tory party is trying to modernise, trying to become a genuine modern conservative party, but finds it's got this really, really strong sort of militant Protestant tendency fed by the, by the Orange Order, and it causes real dysfunction and, and, and difficulties. And I think that's the beginning of the end, actually, for, for, um, for the Orange Order. For, beginning of the end for the Orange Order being the absolutely dominant force, which I think it was, in the popular politics of Liverpool from the middle of the, well, as I say, from the time that it disbanded. But obviously it doesn't really disband in the 1830s, does it? And it's, it keeps going so that it becomes... Uh, oh, I am going to shut up, Colm Murphy. You take over. But, uh, I was going to say, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what happens by the time you come to the early 1830s? You're right, the Tory party actually doesn't know how to proceed. 
after the reform yeah. uh, bill that has passed, the reallocation of MPs, the redrawing of uh, constituencies, um, because the energy for reform at long last has broken through at the, at the parliamentary level and it's running quite strongly. They have to accommodate themselves to the changing uh, political landscape. Uh, Liverpool actually is unusual in that the question of education does come up. Now, I'm yes. not aware that actually the liberal education uh, programme used to do a Bible. I thought that what they did... Oh. Sorry. What, yeah, yeah. what they did was they deliberately fashioned a religious instruction curriculum which avoided passages that had been uh, at the centre of controversy between Protestants and Catholics over mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. uh, like the nature of uh, is the communion mass, is the mass communion, uh, right. and so on. Because um, a scheme had been devised in Ireland mm -hmm. that deliberately actually put forward um, a non-sectarian curriculum um, that avoided the real um, controversial passages. Uh, and this is what the Liberals adopted. Right. And in the uh, debate, actually, uh, it comes up, it's, that's referred to as the Irish system. Yes. Now, for the Tories, actually, um, looking for something to hang their future on, looking for some basis on which to uh, redefine the Tory philosophy and the Tory programme, found that there was a controversy breaking out um, in Liverpool because someone arrives who has experience of that mm -hmm. back in Donegal as a Church of Ireland uh, minister mm -hmm. and he comes from Stranolar and Donegal and he is eventually preferred into uh, St Jude's Church which is the ruined uh, church and he looks uh, at what he finds in Liverpool and he is appalled because in fact it breaches for him, one of the central uh, pillars of Protestantism, which is to say that the individual person has the right to, to freely search the entire Bible in, the, in his personal search uh, for salvation. But here, in fact, is a religious curriculum that's mm -hmm. leaving out, the, they sort of argue, vital parts of Holy Scripture. So he launches a campaign, and a very successful campaign, uh, against the liberal education scheme. And the local Tory party says, wow, this is actually rousing people that normally we could not actually okay, right, yeah. add in our support. And they begin to associate themselves uh, with this particular theme of here what you have sort of coming in is, if you want, popery mm -hmm. under the guise uh, of freedom. Now, for the Orange, uh, the Orange Order, of course, this strikes all sorts mm -hmm. um, of resonances because the Orange Order had survived um, and put down roots in the Liverpool area. The lodges, the lodges were quite, um, quite strong in a sense, uh, in, a, in a quiet, understated way. Um, mm -hmm. They certainly had their traditional philosophy of ultra-Protestantism, anti-Catholicism, um, but all of a sudden, actually, they find now they have a spokesperson uh, leading this education campaign, and this is all resonating with them. And the spokesperson is the Reverend Hugh McNeil, uh, who, as I say, for quite a few years was the minister uh, at St. Jude's Churches. He was an extraordinary individual um, in physical appearance, you know, tall, powerful, splendid voice, brilliant preacher, uh, brilliant on the political platform uh, as, as well. And of course, uh, he strikes all sorts of resonances with the Orange Lodges. We're delighted to see here is somebody who is the leading evangelical and Anglicanism in Liverpool, and he's actually pressing all their buttons for them. And actually, in a sense, he's also providing them with, as they would say it, uh, biblical justification for their traditional prejudices, if I could put it as crudely as that. So you can see the marriage there between yeah. the Lodges Hugh McNeil and those who are associated with him, uh, and the Tory party decides this is the, this is the lane they take. Right, yeah. um, and by 1842, the Liberals are out. Mm -hmm. And between 1842 and 1955, the Tory party controlled Liverpool Council, except for one brief period, I think, in the very early 1890s. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's only then that Labour breaks mm -hmm. through. 
quite simply because there is a large working class Tory vote. And there's also a large working class Irish nationalist vote, of course. Mm -hmm. You would think of that as being the natural Labour constituency. It was split right down in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, hence the fact that Labour doesn't control the council until 1955. 55, yeah. And that yeah. is very late in <coughs> urban politics uh, in Britain, because mm -hmm. Labour by then was controlling places like Sheffield, Manchester, mm -hmm. uh, and Leeds. But no. Um, uh, not Liverpool until 1955, and doesn't take a majority of the parliamentary seats until about 1945, I think. No, 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 no. Um, and indeed, the Tories actually do continue this theme of being the political, local political expression uh, of uh, working class Protestantism um, in Liverpool. So that, for example, when the Working Man's Conservative Association is founded in 1868, I think, isn't it? Yeah. It is the Working Man's Protestant Conservative Association, mm -hmm. and it has as one of its first principles uh, the preservation and expression uh, of Protestantism. There is, as you've hinted, a particular Tory leadership style. They deliberately cultivate the style. How would you describe it, I suppose? Um, it's patricians, patrician leaders actually stooping to conquer, one can say. They deliberately cultivated an ethos in the local conservative associations, which was inclusive, uh, which um, welcomed certainly the entre entrepreneur, the merchant, the, but also the shopkeeper and the skilled working class and the unskilled working class. Um, and the leadership style was inclusive um it was folksy um it was a sort of hail fellow well met sort of notion where everybody was wel welcome uh, and they had a succession of leaders um well right down um until the 1940s yeah. um that expressed that um boss politics in britain you could say uh, was born in liverpool so it is Archibald Salvage from about 1868 mm. onwards, and after that, it's oh, Thomas White. Now, Salvage is not actually a member of the Orange Order, but he deliberately plays to Orange ideas and principles. Uh, Sir Thomas White, who followed him, was yes, uh, a very, very much. Ardent, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, ardent member uh, mm -hmm. of the Orange Order, and he, in turn, and I'm sort of, I've now forgotten who it is that succeeds him. Uh, but they also they always maintain that Protestant emphasis, but that inclusive ethos um, and, and that folksy style of leadership. Mm -hmm. So there clearly are some strong personalities as well that you've been looking at with McNeil and these boss politic figures yes. and so on. So that, uh... Yes, there are. Um, and <coughs> you look at him, Salvage actually, um, I think he was vice chairman of a brewery, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. Bent. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and he is an interesting character, absolutely ruthless. Uh, he was leader, and you rode in behind him. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't, that was the end of your political career and your yeah. political aspirations. Very shrewd. He knew where the strength uh, of the party lay. He knew how to tickle the supporters and their mm -hmm. funny bones. Um, uh, a first-class campaigner, yeah. uh, indeed, and he ends up the right honourable Sir Archibald Salvage. Yeah, yeah. And that, in fact, is the Conservative Party at the national level realising that this, this local provincial um, level, they do have a leader with a strong working class support. Um, now, beyond that, there are other personalities there, aside from Hugh McNeill um, and Salvage, because something actually begins to happen towards the end of the 19th century that concerns the Orange Order in particular. And that is the fact that there is growing up within the Church of England what's known as the Anglo-Catholic movement. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes also called the Oxford movement and sometimes the Tractarian movement. Basically, uh, it's an element within the, the Church of England that believes that the Reformation uh the church lost some of the how does one express it some of the color and the ritual and the numinosity if i can use mm -hmm. the word of a worship and the sense of awe and reverence because of what it dropped uh in terms of ceremony ritual uh vestments and so on um 
and they argue for bringing that into the Church mm. of England. Now, for some people within the Church of England, this is a betrayal of the Protestant heritage, quite honestly. Um, and they begin to campaign for legislation, for example, um, to, um, to, to check that. It is really spotting an opportunity, actually, in 1875, <laughs> brings in the Church Discipline Act, mm. which is an effort uh, to check that. Um, and for the Orange Order, it is really in Protestant and, uh, and conservative governments were what they really wanted. Um, but what they wanted is those governments to deliver on church discipline. It didn't work. And by the 1880s and 1890s, going through the newspapers and um, going through also the records of the Orange Order, you see there's increasing discontent uh, over this question of church discipline, that basically conservative governments are not being Protestant enough. Yeah. Uh, now, when liberals come in, then the Orange Order will rally very much to the conservatives. Uh, but when conservatives come in, and then disappoint them. Um, because there is an element, with a strong element in the Conservative Party that was quite high church, as they would describe mm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Lord Salisbury tended that direction. Mm. And in the later generation, Lord Halifax uh, was uh, of the same disposition. You got there for conviction growing that uh, amongst many people in the Orange Order that you really cannot trust the Conservative <coughs> Party to mm. tackle these issues. Um, and they begin to think in terms of separate Protestant political organization. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, under the leadership of a man called George Wise, they actually break from the Church of England and uh, set up a Protestant reformers church, as they call it, uh, in the northern end of Liverpool, and the Protestant party, which is represented in the city council, incidentally, from mm -hmm. 1903 until 1973, I think. Um, uh, uh, so it's for 70 years mm -hmm. they are there in the church council, uh, 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 the city council, um, and they take uh, the strong support uh, from, from the Orange Order. Now, it seems strange to us today, I suspect, um, that people should get themselves so worked up uh, mm -hmm. over things like uh, yeah. ritual and vestments and how much illumination by candles that there is in a church and how a church uh, service is conducted. But for many, for literally for tens of thousands of people in Liverpool, uh, down well into the early 20th century, these were key issues because the high church element with, within the uh, Church of England was essentially treasonable, mm -hmm. undermining the Protestant foundations of the British constitution and the established British church mm -hmm. and had to be stopped. Conservative governments were not doing it because the 1875 Act introduced by Disraeli, who, well, let's put it about Disraeli. Yes, he was very clearly of Jewish cultural background, but uh, his father had had him uh, christened um, with the Church of England. Um, and because there was a ban on Jews entering the House of Commons until 1858, I think. Um, uh, let's put it this way, Disraeli was proud of his Jewish heritage. But when he was in his estate at Huendon in, uh, in England, he acted the part of the Tory uh, Church of England uh, square. Yeah. And he acted it out very nicely. But then much of his life was a performance, wasn't it? <laughs> so you have therefore under a, a strong personality called George Wise, um, the beginnings of a Protestant party in Liverpool and a separate church. Mm -hmm. The party doesn't exist, uh, it dissolves in uh, 1973. The oh. church closes, I think, finally uh, in the early 1980s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But where else in the country yeah. do you yeah. find that element actually on the local council? Yes. Uh, up yeah. in Scotland, yeah. yes, in yeah. Glasgow and Edinburgh yeah. in the 1920s and 1930s, but yeah. I can't think of yeah. anywhere else. No, no. Um, no, it's one of those Liverpool unique things. I, I, it I agree. Is. But I think why sort of is a, a useful way of, of wrapping this up, I think, in the sense that if you mention George Wise to most people, they think straight away of the incredible sectarian rioting in 1909. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was yes. the worst rioting that there ever was, when we actually get um, whole areas cleared by. Um, by gangs and so on to make sure that there are any people of the right type were there and so on. But if you look at Wise's career, 
um, you know, and what WISE is doing. You can see very much the type of thing which explains why the Orange Order, um, and on the other side, why some of the, the Catholic associations persist so long as they do, because they're not just there uh, to make sure that um, you know, all the lads come out when you need them for, for, for a fight, but they provide all sorts of other things. I mean, there's a huge tontine society around George Wise, so it's incredible sort of collective mutuality, mutual aid um, that was there. The large cycling club in Liverpool at this time is the George Wise Cycling Club and so on. So you're getting this sociability, collective, mutual aid and so on, all wrapped together. And I think that's really, to me, why um, Liverpool is so backward in the forward march of Labour history, because who needs a, a Labour Party? I mean, a Labour Party actually is in a way premised on the fact that you need to have sort of skilled males to start the process off, um, so that it's not really covering all of the, of the working class. But when you look at sectarian Liverpool, uh, if you want to have mutual aid, if you want to have some sort of collective security, if you want to have some type of sociability, if you want to have some fun, um, you can have it irrespective of your gender, irrespective of your skill level. All that matters is, are you one of us? If you're one of us, you're covered. Um, and that seems to me to be a more inclusive thing than, than, than Labour is ever capable really of, of doing. So in some respects, um, I, I feel very ambivalent when I draw this to a close in the sense of having said, well, how inclusive, how wonderful. Uh, and yet, if I think of the other side of wise and the sectarian rioting and the violence, I think, oh, thank God that sectarianism is all gone. But I think we have to recognise that there were valuable and positive elements to it. Um, so I, I do really appreciate that. And if you want to see that really spelt out in full detail, read Mervyn's wonderful monograph. So I think that's, if, if Frank's anywhere around, he might have gathered that I might be saying, I think it's over to you now, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. I mean, that was a fascinating um, insight. And really, I, I'm conscious that we're only really getting started. And I certainly have many questions. Um, that, that I'll, I'll say for a glass of wine afterwards. Um, the, I, for a while, I thought we were talking about 2023, a Tory party that doesn't know how to proceed, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. looking for something to hang their future on. Um, it sounded very, uh, uh, very much like uh, today. Um, the whole issue of, uh, of Liverpool being a Tory city for so long was something that amazed me when I first came here um, in 2000. You know, this place that I thought of as entirely Labour. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the Orange Order clearly is one way to explain that, that history. Um, you don't want to hear me going on. I, I'm going to take a few questions uh, before we retire. A, a back row there, yes. Uh, two questions. One, um, I'm a great friend of Edward Klein, a very loved Lord Mayor, uh, Jewish. And he, when he was a, a yeoman councillor, was a member of the Protestant Party mm -hmm. of the Jewish man. Was that on, basically on the basis that if, if you obviously weren't a Catholic, you were welcome? Or, <laughs> Fine, I know very, I don't think I know anything about him. Um, and he was a member of the Protestant Party. Yes, he's a councillor. Right. The Protestant Party. Well, I've been. He told me himself. So it's not <laughs> right. I thought I had a full list of everyone who had stood for the Protestant Party, actually, and I'm not sure I came across that name. Councillor but... Klein was not a member of the Thank you. Uh, just, can I just add? Ian Henderson is here. Yeah. Ian, can I just, how does that strike you, Ian? No, Councillor Klein was never, never, never member of the party. Yeah, I must explain. Uh, Ian's father, actually, Ronald Henderson, led the Protestant Party for a time, actually, on the council. Mm -hmm. And so I've never come across. Uh, the name of Klein. I think I have a pretty exhaustive list. So uh, I think there's been a, uh, a little bit of uh, um, mistransmission of um, information there. What was your other question? What connections, direct and indirect, between the Protestant Party and the Jewish 
uh, be careful actually to think that the Orange Order is aping the Freemasons because uh, in 18th century Britain and Ireland, it was quite a common thing for men to gather together in groups, swearing oaths, um, sharing passwords, uh, socializing, uh, dressing uh, in a particular form with particular colors uh, and conducting uh, meetings under heavily titled worshipful masters. The two are definitely different organizations. In fact, in Ireland at times they clash, clashed because mm -hmm. the Orange Order is definitely strong, well, exclusively Protestant. The Freemasons are vaguely deist um, and there was Catholic membership and there still is, even though the Vatican has never been happy with mm -hmm. secret oath-bound organizations of any description. Um, but, uh, but, but the assumption is that the Orange Order is aping the Freemasons. They're not. Are there some people who are members of both? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, John Holding, for example. Yeah. We'll take a question over yes. here, please. Yeah. Sorry, so was there any peak period? Peak period. Uh, first of all, the date 1819, as far as we can see, is the first time the Orange Order parade in Liverpool uh, in a public procession. Now, I think there are hints there might have been something earlier, um, but it's difficult to be definite about that. And incidentally, when I went to look at the newspapers to report on the 1819 procession, uh, there's no tra trace of that material on any of the microfilms there uh, that are there at all. Um, 1982, I chose because that's the date of the papal visit to Liverpool. It seemed an appropriate point at which to uh, close things off. Um, aside from the fact that, quite honestly, I had to close at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Question from John. Tom. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't address the sorry. the peak, peak period. period. Yeah. Peak period. Yep. It's very hard to say because um, the, the data bank is so imperfect, actually. I suppose what I could have done is have looked at all the Grand Lodge reports from uh, 1876. There were two groups of Orange, uh, Orange Lodges between 1836 when they dissolved themselves and 1876 when they all came together. There was two groups for a time. Uh, so I suppose I, if I could get hold of all of the reports, annual reports of the Grand Lodge, I could have counted them up, but quite frankly, I think my nerve ran out at that point. <laughs> that point. But I was, I was given access to Jim Roberts' collection, actually, of reports. And thank you. It's been great. Um, right. John. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Murray. Uh, what, what, what do you see as the main reason for the decline of I think it's the fact that British society changes very profoundly in the 20th century. A lot of the issues which have always been so central to the Orange Order is concerned, especially those around religion and religious identity, actually become far less significant as uh, public Christian practice in Britain uh, declines uh, very sharply. Um, also, I think the fact that uh, that, if you want, is the broad, broader national question. One or two of the other concerns of the Orange Order, I mean, their royalism. Uh, well, frankly, um, you know, the question of whether Britain should be um, a monarchy or a republic is not actually disputed. It's not central to the agenda. I mean, some people would like it to be, but quite frankly, it isn't. Uh, um, 
the Church of England, uh, well, you know, it's a wide spectrum. Uh, it is it's a very broad church, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Um, and there's no great controversy, I think, uh, over forms of worship on the whole with the, the Church of England these days. They are concerned, they're more concerned with sex, quite honestly. <laughs> and I say that as a member. <laughs> Um, and the, uh, yes, slum clearance and redevelopment. Now, I think there are some people in the order in Liverpool have always been convinced that the redrawing of local government boundaries was basically fiddled to extinguish uh, their strongholds up in the north and end in St. Domingo and Netherfield. But mm -hmm. the local council doesn't have responsibility for redrawing boundaries, as you know, that's the Boundary Commission actually does that. Um, and public bodies like the order have the right to make their representations uh, to the Boundary Commission. But um, the question of um, slum clearance redevelopment, uh, yes, you're right. The notion of dealing with the terrible uh, housing problems uh, in Liverpool provoked for a long time the notion that the best thing to do is to clear them out and decant a good part of the population into peripheral estates. Um, and there was also some notion, I think, within the order that this was a deliberate policy of Jack Braddock, in particular, as he takes over as political bro, uh, boss, and then with Dave Sefton, I think, mm -hmm. uh, who follows him. Mm -hmm. And that there was right. built into their decisions a definite notion of clearing out the Protestant strongholds. Um, no, I, I don't think that was the reason at all, quite honestly. Um, but, however, the thing is, of course, one of the things that's um, comes out in the book is the very intense localism uh, of the lodges particularly in districts um, you know where successive generations of families have been in the same area and uh, in the lodges now once you clear them out then they have to start reforming their lodges out in the peripheral areas um, some didn't wish to bother um, some actually find it difficult to get used to living in the peripheral estates some wanted to stay with membership of the lodges of the places that they have left, uh, which you can do, you can do, but nonetheless, it's not quite the same. But I don't think that was a deliberate policy, uh, quite honestly, of, of the local council. <coughs> Take a question here. Yeah. How successful has the house support of the last 14 independents during the period of the book, from the 1890s to 1916? Because you know, how successful the do you mean successful in, in the published names of the of the Orange Lodge? Um, if you mean successful in actually checking the um, high church movement within the Church of England, well, yeah, all, all the, uh, the the things that you mentioned, the campaigning, the <coughs> so eloquence in the in campaigning, they must have had a, a particular set of aims. Do you think they achieved? Well, certainly in checking the high church movement within the Church of England, no, they didn't. Uh, quite honestly. And you find that some of the things that were introduced by the high church element actually spread right across the spectrum, that broad spectrum within the C of E. Um, and you can see certain rituals within what churches that would consider themselves to be very much low church evangelical. Um, and you watch them um, and you think to yourself, you know, 60 or 70 years ago there would have been a riot over that, but it's not accepted. Um, I think if you actually look at the lodges and say, were they successful in perpetuating themselves as an organization and as lodges well into the 20th century? Yes, they were pretty successful in that very localized, introverted uh, aims that, the, that they had. Could I just come in there and say that I think I'm sort of politically, you could argue, yes, they, they were, because they, they managed throughout this period to preserve the marginal privilege of the Protestant working class. So, you know, they're in privileged positions in terms of corporation employment, various things of that nature. Um, and uh, yes, I, I think they, 
the way they're able to do that, and they're always, always able to ensure that the Tory party recognises the need for significant reforms. I mean, we were talking about the Liberals getting it wrong with education. Um, what, they, um, what the Tories realise that people want is, is housing reform and, and public health reform, and so they d they're delivering that. So I think that the pressure that the lodges are putting on, as it were, as being the main sort of staple of Protestant working class support for the Tory party, ensures that Protestant workers do better than Catholics in the labour market and also ensures you're getting the type of reforms that you want. So leaving aside the theology, which I know is terribly, terribly important because after all, yes, we're saying that they are Protestants, they are Tories, they are loyalists, they're imperialists. Quite clearly, if you are saying which is the most important, that is clearly the Protestantism. So in that sense, the way that Mervyn answered the question is right. But if you look at it as someone who's not a specialist on the Orange thing, but looks at 19th century politics in Liverpool, you can say, yeah, I'm sure the Orange Order you know, did quite nicely because they got their share of the bargain with the Tories very nicely out of this. I can see a whole forest of questions now. I'm going to take two more and try and finish on the hour. OK, um, Barry. Well, I think I will be finishing soon. Breakfast will be served. Um, there's at least three PhDs there, Barry. Um, de dealing with their, their reaction of the Liverpool Orange Order to uh, Northern Ireland's uh, troubles from very early on, from the first of the troubles in 1968, I am finding concern um, about uh, the situation in Northern Ireland. I'm finding Grand Lodge uh, meetings are <coughs> marked very often by resolutions of support. Um, it's largely verbal until you get to 1971 when the riots in Belfast uh, result in a massive shift of population, uh, uh, both from the Protestant and Catholic communities. And of course, there is a flight of refugees uh, over to Liverpool, um, which is organized by the Orange Order over here. And there's a section here uh, in, uh, in the book uh, de dealing with that. Um, and there is indeed a, quite a vivid mural in Canada Street in Belfast, um, and again that's in the book, uh, which uh, records this, you know, people, people coming over. Um, what was your other question? Your other, um, Indeed. Uh, I don't know is the string, straight answer. I mean, what what changes are you thinking of? I'm thinking really of, for example, um, uh, the ways in which some of the human powers would ah. step with the Christian Catholic political elite in the south of Britain. Right. Um, they, you know, they, there appears to be on newspaper evidence um, a, a lack of support amongst um, Catholic Catholic officials for Well, I'm thinking you're quite right. I think there was there was a turning of the back on the Northern Ireland issue, but that I think goes right across the political spectrum, um, and the considerable effort is put in by all of the main parties on this side of the Irish Sea to ensure that they do not become too deeply involved in the Northern Ireland question and that it does not become a partisan issue uh, between them. 
Um, Powell's trajectory is an interesting one because, of course, he ends up as unionist MP for South Down. Um, it's interesting, incidentally, that um, one of the chief workers in his campaigns was Jeffrey Donaldson. Mm. And I'm not no. going any further. To be that. continued. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll yeah. take one last question just over here, please. What was the stance on the Irish Builder in Liverpool in relation to the government plan? Is that the plan that they can have a few months there and the plan being a few months there and they have a certain stance to this or are they very strong? Thank you. Yes. Uh, and there's a section in the book that sort of deals with that. Basically, it was very awkward, in fact, for the Conservative Party once the negotiations between the uh, Sinn Féin um, and the British government begin in <coughs> July 1921, uh, and then the uh, speed picks up and culminates, of course, uh, in the uh, Anglo-Irish Treaty in December uh, 1921. Now, there was a Conservative Party national conference um, in Liverpool in November um, and it was clear that the whole question of the negotiations with uh, Sinn Féin uh, was going to come up um, and they wondered if they were going to get their business through. Something else is creeping into my head about certain parallels <laughs> uh, running at the moment but you know Liverpool uh, was almost the worst possible venue for holding that conference at that time um, and there was there were some hostile motions that were put onto the conference uh, agenda but salvage actually manages to devise a compromise whereby the tory conference accepts the legitimacy of the negotiations of uh, going on in november and culminating in december but in a sense he was at that point the key peacemaker in actually saying it's time the Tory party uh, accepted not merely uh, home rule but two home rule parliaments and they passed it uh, thanks to him as for the boundary commission um, in 1917 the protestant uh, George Wise di died and Harry Dixon Longbottom um, become not quite his immediate successor, but eventually succeeds him, leading the church and the Protestant party. Now, when the Boundary Commission uh, clause uh, in the treaty is finally activated, and they come uh, to devising uh, a revised boundary, as they thought, um, there was some concern in the Orange Order, in fact, that this was going to emasculate the territory of Northern Ireland to the point where it'd be an unviable state and would collapse into the free state. Now, this is one of the arguments that Michael Collins, of course, uh, uses uh, in the Doyle. Um, and you find there, there's an, a, um, a point at which, as the report of the Boundary Commission uh, is increasingly expected in 1925, um, there's growing anxiety within the Orange Order that Northern Ireland is going to collapse under the territorial changes uh, and one, I think it's a district meeting, is interrupted by two Northern Ireland MPs uh, who burst into a lodge meeting, or burst in, who come into a lodge meeting as part of a campaign being waged by elements of the Orange Order um, and the Protestant Party to make sure that, you know, the Boundary Commission actually doesn't emasculate Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, so you, you can read about it uh, in, in the book. In the event, of course, as we know, when it came to the report of the Boundary Commission, its report was ready, and then was it the Morning Chronicle? I seem to remember, actually leaks it because the unionist representative on the three members of the Boundary Commission leaked it to the newspaper, and in fact, you know, the sw switches of territory that connect were were negligible. There are one or two cases where they actually suggesting yes, Northern Ireland should cede territory to the Free State. But there were areas where it was said the Free State should actually cede territory to Northern Ireland. They were minuscule. Um, the two governments decided, no, this was such a disaster that, you know, leave the border as it is. And the report of the Boundary Commission actually doesn't come out until about 1967, I think it 
is. Um, but it's a fascinating document, actually, when you look at the, news, the, uh, the representations that were put forward. Uh, and the geographer in me, of course, is fascinated by um, the, the uh, maps uh, that are produced. Okay, I, I know there are other questions, but we're, we're, uh, we've run out of time, and I hope you'll join us for uh, a drink afterwards in the lobby. Um, terrific conversation. I'm so pleased that this book has been published. I know that Mervyn's been working on it for a long time, and uh, that uh, it's been a labor of love. And it, but it's a, it's, it's a book that, I'm, that we, we needed, I think, in the history of, of Liverpool. Um, and in the history of, of Irish Liverpool especially. Uh, so please put your hands together for Mervyn and John. <laughs>